Daw Nation, welcome to this week's episode of In The Daw with Biometrics, breaking down his song, No One. In this episode, you're gonna learn about how to make hybrid trap, how Biometrics makes hard hitting 808s, how to make it so your reverbs do not clash, and we're gonna talk about Biometrics workflow, which consists of FL Studio and Ableton. And as a bonus, Biometrics is giving away serum patches from certain sounds in this song. If you wanna find out which ones he's giving away, you can download them from the link in the description. And finally, we are proud to announce that In The Daw is getting its very own YouTube channel. That that can be found over on the Daw Nation YouTube channel. We are making the official move over to that channel on June 26, 2019. So make sure to head over there and subscribe and hit the little notification bell for all future episodes of In the Daw and Behind the Daw. But Daw Nation, let's get into this episode right now. <laughs> Honestly, what I love to start with is to start with the melodic pieces. The melodic pieces to me in a song are kind of the DNA, like everything kind of builds off from that. So tell me about your melodic pieces. Like how did you write the melody? Did you come up with it as a sample? What, where did the melody of this song come from? It's kind of a funny story with this track actually. So this track is kind of a combination of two tracks, two different tracks that never made it to like a final track. So they kind of got taken in to make this one track. So yeah, so basically me melody wise, I, pl I play everything in like it's, it's Fruity Loop, the piano roll is pretty good, but yeah. But for example, like that Glockenspiel sound at the beginning, you know, Omnisphere is an absolute classic for a lot of these sounds. <laughs> Just to fill the space a little bit, so I added another layer underneath it. Um, I can't really say who it was. Originally going to make it out as a remix, and then I um, took this top line, the vocal top line here from another track that I wrote, and sped it up because it was originally a 140 piece. And then from there, just started building building a track really. So you know, landed on this sound here for the drop. And um, yeah, from there, kind of. Just restructured the top line. So the glockenspiel at the beginning and then that sound that you just played in the drop, which melodic piece of those came first? Which one of them kind of built off of each other, I guess is what I'm looking for. So it, yeah, it started It started with this. This was like the very first point. I literally just played that. Let's just that go in. And then you kind of start the structure. So you start with your basic melody and then just like allocate a section for the drop and then allocate a section with that melody again and then yeah, and then I just kind of added in the uh, the groove, and then the drop came after that. Well, so with the melodic part of the drop, is that a variation of the melody that you were playing at the very beginning? I don't think so. I think it was a completely new one. So what? So like the di the difference between this melody and. The drop melody, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Did, did those play off of each other or were they independently created from each other and they're not related at all? Uh, no. Oh, yeah. No. So they were they were they were always together. Like basically the vocals were uh, the vocals were from another song. And then this was originally a remix. So so they, these were they were always written. To, they were always written together. Like I got once I got to this point here, because this one started from the I wrote from the beginning. So once I got to this point here, I then went straight into the drop and came up with that melody. This was the first thing that came out. And then I just adapted it and changed the the key once I had the new top line. That drop synth that you have going on, that lead that you got going on. So with that, how did you design it? That was that was pretty cool. Or, or you know, as a preset or what? What is it? To be honest with you, it started as a preset, which is fine. Uh, it's a double layered synth, so there's two sounds going on. So you've got uh, the first one, is like a weird sort of deep housey thing. Like to be honest with you, I my sound design, I I uh, usually just like find a good preset and then mess with it loads until I make this a, a sound that I can use in various shapes and forms, and then save that and. And then like a few months later, I might load that sound up and think, oh, I'll mess with it again. So this this is like, I think like two saves or two saves ago, it was like a preset. But yeah, essentially this is like, so you've got this sound here. And then, um, on top of that, um, 
So guys, if you want that preset, if you want to go in and see more detail about that preset, that is for free download down in the description, make sure to go click on that. The, the two presets that you just showed, are they automating over time or are they, you know, you are, you have them programmed in Serum and that's kind of it. The sounds themselves like stay pretty similar to, to how you heard them cool. throughout the most, throughout the most part. Um, obviously does you know, you put your, that would be delay there, but put your EQs on there. I'm also using this plugin called Endless Smile. This little guy, mate, he like makes my day every day. Look at him, he's, he's awesome. He, he, this is like this is this is like such a shortcut I find. So quite often, what I do is I'll like just put like a really fast reverb filter on at the end, um, just to to give it that that fizz. <laughs> So yeah, so essentially what's happening is at the end of the phrases, the simps are automating the cutoffs up high here. Like here. And then you've also got like the, the 808 doing a, an attack pitch bend just underneath just to give a bit of a weird wobbly sub feel to it. So on the downbeat, you have like that big kind of like, kind of hornish kind of synth sounding sound. What What is that? This one. So this one is, you know, just like a, again, another one built off the back of a preset. Yeah, I'm pretty bad at explaining on the uh, the sound design processes, but essentially that was built from, I think it was off the Cymatics preset before. Obviously just chucked a bit of like distortion on it, just to give it a bit of fizz. Give it some anger, you know, to put, chuck the uh, tube amp on it. Yeah, and it was like, you know, obviously originally it was a bit more of a dubstep -y, like. but then I just chucked it down to there and there we have it. So question that a question that I get a lot when people are making like a you know, like this kind of like hybrid trap kind of vibe, you know, when you have you know, obviously in the drop, you have your big, thick, meaty 808s. But then, you know, like this lead that we were looking at uh, uh, two questions ago, the lead that we're going to be giving away on that one, it, you got the, some reverb on it. And a lot of people, what they say is that when they have these big leads with these with these big reverbs on it, they find that the reverb just gets messy way too quick and gets way too muddy. Do you have anything to remedy that? Or, or what do you think about that? What, just in terms of it clashing with the and all the extra space. Not necessarily clash. It's kind of like in bar one when the lead comes in and it, you know, explodes into reverb with the lead, right? The, the lead is very thick in reverb. By the time the bar two comes around and the lead starts playing again, it, they find that, that the kind of like the, the reverb hasn't decayed enough. And so now you got the old reverb from the from bar one now meshing with the reverb from bar two in the same lead. And it just becomes like this big, like muddy, messy kind of mess. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. I think... Yeah, you've got to be really careful with the reverbs in in uh, hybrid trap. I find, especially as like so much of it's about making you know the transients and like the really quick cutoffs, and suddenly you have everything, and then you have nothing. And you know, obviously, a big part of it is is leaving enough space from all the other sounds that are going on as well. You know, if you've got like a bass, you've got like an actual like mid mid dirty bass and an eight oh eight and a reverb synth going on. You obviously have to knock a load of the uh, the clashing frequencies out on the EQ of the lowest of the mid synth just to allow the space for the the reverb decay and then obviously if you can then automating like automating the actual um reverb automating the reverb wet signal as well quite often helps if you can do that like on the beats is that really automating the reverb is where you're going to get the most amount of bang for your buck there uh, like for example what i really like to do like if i have a sound the sound is reverb heavy but i don't want it to be clashing all the time with with other pieces of reverb what i love to do is i love to just put a, a, a side chain compressor on there and compress it to itself so that that when it plays, the reverb drops out. But when it's not playing, the reverb rings out. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a really, really good way of doing it for sure. Absolutely. Have you seen the side chainer in free? the FL Studio side chainer? I, I use the uh, peak controller, so it like links to the volume. I, I'm, I don't know if you've seen no, other guys not, doing yeah, this. Yeah, this is new to me. So that's how I do my side chain. The side chain to a controller, and then the side chain is off the trigger. So I have this trigger here, and every time it triggers, it dips the volume. And then you put that on every kit, basically. So it dips everything out, and then you you can set it up so you can trigger it without the kicks. And it's a bit it's a bit of a long winded way around it, but like you know when you just get into a habit of doing it, and then now it kind of works. Let's talk about that thick 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 eight oh eight down there. That thing that thing is gorgeous. Is is that a sample or did you create it? No, that was that's my uh, that's I made that one on massive. I've kind of had that one. On, I've adapted that one for years actually. So yeah, here it is. it's quite it's a really simple 
simple sound. So it's just made out of your triangle, like you know, your standard triangle sub on um, on massive, and then you know the, you really start to get the uh, the differing, you know, like the fat punch when you start playing with the attacks on the on the envelopes. So. So, for example, there's two layers going on here as well. So it's a it's got like a, a distorted layer at the top as well. So this, yeah. So essentially, that's that's how it's made. It's just a simple like uh, triangle sub. Put that uh, square to a square sign linked to um, linked to your envelope, and then yeah, like you've got this layer going on as well. So you've got like a distorted GABA synth on the top as well. You know what I mean? So you put them together, and it gives that like really kind of heavy. It just gives it. I kind of do that for the iPhone speakers because people will be listening to it, and there's no bass. You want something to resonate through. So, yeah. Is there anything outside of massive? But I know that you have a second layer, that the kind of the top saturated layer. But with your just your sine wave sub, is there anything outside of massive that you do to it? Uh, what for? What with the eight oh eight? Yeah, with the eight oh eight. Um, yeah, well, I'm I'm side chaining it to the kick every time. But apart from that, no. I mean, it's mainly like. Uh... Yeah, no, it's, it's all just coming straight through um, through massive. Uh, but you've got like a tube on there as well and like a little bit of the clip set setting just to give it a little bit of distortion and then you tweak that depending on what key the song's in and how it fits. But yeah, it's essentially like it's just sub frequencies really. So it's more about like providing that into the into the mix and then building other sounds around it to fill it out like this one. Well, actually, I, I have got another one thing I was going to like sort of ask actually, like because I know it's one of the questions you sometimes asked was, um, what were you scared to put in the song? Yeah, yeah, let's, let's talk about that. What were you scared to put in the song? Yeah, so, and actually, there is on this song there was a last drop that I was going to put in, and then I didn't because I was like, oh, is it too far off like the genre? I was going to put a drum and bass in at the end. At the moment, the final drop is this. I Yeah, but then I was gonna I was gonna play with something like this. But I was like, nah, keep it keep it simple. So you ultimately decided that you didn't want to do that just because was it was it out of creativity that you didn't want to do it or were you were you scared? It was a fear based decision that you didn't want to do it. You know how like a big when you're as as a producer you you write the song and then it's about like trying to get it onto as many outlets as possible so you can get as much coverage for the track. So it was sort of thinking, would that put off some of the curators or not? I did notice something when you were playing the final drop that we didn't cover. You had these little like dubstep growls that come in here and there. Can we talk about those really quick? Yeah, for sure. Oh, this one. That is a preset, that one. <laughs> yeah. That was a preset, and then, yeah, it's got a bit of a capital on it, because obviously that just makes it. And then it's just, again, like, we automate the reverb here and there just to give it some more depth, like, endless smile changes all. Is there anything else in this song that you wanted to talk about that we didn't get a chance to talk about? I mean, I guess, like, in terms of the vocals as well, like, uh, there's quite a lot of layering going on on the vocals. Um, I've put a few, like, robotic sounds in the background. Too many people go through their life without a lifeline. You and me got chemistry like nothing in a lifetime. If you're the fire, then baby, I'll be the ignition. We'll be taking over like there ain't no competition. You make me high when I'm feeling so low without even trying. Yeah, I'm a fool for doing what I do, but I ain't found no one like you. So I mean, again, that like kind of brought a lot to the track I found as well, just because it's quite empty. So I was just trying to give it like this kind of almost digital, like not quite human sound. So I was like pitching down all the form and filters on Little Alter Boy by Sound Toys, which gives it that kind of robotic effect. It sounded like you had kind of like a, not a vocoder, top box? Top, yeah. Top box, yeah. Yeah, so um, 
Yeah, I was using a uh, vocal synth for that. Is that vocal synth one through one or two? Uh, two vocal synth two. So good, such it's such a freaking good synth. It's so good, isn't it? It's so easy, like so out of the box. It's just crazy how you can get so such amazing sounds. I would show you, but like I actually do all my all the vocal stuff that I do. I do in Ableton, so I kind of use Ableton like hand in hand with it. But it's just so good to sample it, sampling, you know. So normally, so I I do this in Ableton, process the vocals, and then import them into FL to to, to carry on working on it. So tell me about that because i'm really really interested in that so you kind of got you kind of got your your ableton fl hybrid workflow i mean why 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 not just one or the other why are you using both so like ableton is it's just amazing for audio editing um, and i just think i think it's kind of unbeaten in terms of how fast it is in the workflow on it and um you know quite often like i live with uh, a lot of musicians and i work with a lot of session musicians and i look quite often like recording like more and more i'm recording like live audio and then messing with it like uh pheromones an older track of mine like the drop was the sound of a saucepan for example and you can't really i don't find fl has as many uh, tools for that as ableton if you know what i mean i feel like ableton just has so much uh, you can do really quickly so i kind of will we'll do all the audio audio processing there and then bounce it into fl and then process it further do you foresee yourself in the future just converting over to ableton or do you kind of like this workflow that you got going on i think i'm gonna i'm gonna do you know what i'm gonna do this year i'm gonna put some time in to like really just up my game in terms of finishing songs in ableton because i've been using fl for so long and it's uh, the piano roll is so good as well i just get like it's so easy to just go back to it because it's so quick but i definitely think there's a lot to be said for being able to, to nail it in in multiple daws just for like collaboration and banding your ability as many of the listeners know and i'm sure as you know as well i'm, I'm a very hardcore ableton guy and so when i see someone that has this that kind of has like the the dual da workflow it's very very interesting to me you know like a fitch do you know who fitch is yeah yeah i do we're doing we're actually doing a collab at the moment so you probably you probably already know this for the listeners who don't know this he he like writes and produces an ableton that does all the mix down and pro tools which is like extremely interesting to me it's really cool to see the diversity of work definitely yeah it's weird i mean i think it's it's also like i do yeah mastering i do in, in ableton as well actually let's talk about that for a minute because i'm interested did you master this song that we're looking at right now uh yes i did but it was it was just a multi-band compressor Oh, that's Ableton all. That's all you did. You just threw a multiband compressor on on the mix. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, like I tried really hard to just get the mix. Is like I don't know. I just found the mix was like there's a lot of like space, and I felt like a lot of the mastering, the putting too much mastering when it was making it feel too compressed, just because it wasn't letting the sub resonate as much. So I just thought a little bit of multiband compression on it, and that was it. But yeah, I've got the. Yeah, unfortunately, I didn't save the master chain. This is because obviously I produced the track in FL and then mastered it. Enabled. Is that pretty standard when you do a mastering? Is that is basically a multiband compressor? Yeah, usually most of the time sometimes i'll try ozone a little bit as well but i just don't really get on with ozone so much and so is it mostly like a multi-band compressor followed by a limiter is that usually basically it yeah, yeah. like you uh no just usually i just it's just a multi-band compressor I don't know, really. final question that i have for you you know you've heard on the other episodes basically you know, like if you could go back and recreate this song is there anything that you'd want to do differently this tune yeah i mean i would, i would like to get like a i'd like to have had a different vocalist on it i reckon like i would love to get like a uh you know an amazing r&b singer on this just just to give it like a bit just to lift it that extra level um and yeah maybe put uh maybe maybe i keep the uh, drum and bass drop in at the end if if just you know how there's always room to lift the track another level exactly i agree and i did i did want to tell you you know how you're saying that like maybe you want to get into really finally wrestling the the ableton monster and really getting to know everything with that i got some good news for you it's it's not out yet but basically what it is is it is a we took the ableton manual we made an entire course about it but we made it funny we made it fun and it explains every single thing about ableton in such an easy to learn and entertaining way it's absolutely fantastic so, i'm going on that along with the uh, along with the sound design course that you've just given me as well learn my way to success well dude do you have any uh, final words for our listeners today um well yeah i guess just like thanks thanks so much for having me on it's been really cool to be on in the door thanks so much for having me on man Hey, Daw Nation, hope you enjoyed this episode of In The Daw with Biometrics, breaking down his song, No One. If you really like this episode, I would highly encourage you to like, comment, and subscribe, and click that little notification bell so you can get notified when we put out another episode. Also, I'd highly encourage you to go subscribe to the Daw Nation YouTube channel. Again, on June 26, 2019, we are officially moving In The Daw over to that YouTube channel, so make sure to go subscribe and click the little notification bell. Also, if you're interested in joining our Patreon to get exclusive perks and behind-the-scenes content, 
make sure to go check that out we also offer private lessons all these things that i'm talking about will be available in the form of links down in the description again make sure to download those free presets that biometrics is giving away in this episode and finally Daw nation i would highly encourage you to check out the last episode of in the daw that one was with delta heavy working on music remotely by collaborating through zoom and layering vocals with vocoding if you're interested in any of those concepts make sure to go check out the delta heavy episode and i would highly encourage you to go check out the last episode of behind the daw if you don't know the difference between in the daw and behind the daw in the daw is where we invite producers to come and dissect their songs but behind the daw is our podcast where we invite music producers artists music industry experts singers songwriters sound designers and everyone else in between to open up on an emotional philosophical artistic branding marketing and overall music business basis so if you want more of that information make sure to go check out behind the daw but i'd highly encourage you to check out the last episode of behind the daw that we just released which was with julian calore and that episode we talk about julian calore's technique on how to create so much music making multiple types of music underneath one brand and how julian calore's purpose is to give everyone the feeling that it's not only okay to be different but it's the best thing in the world so there are links galore down in the description make sure to check out all those things you can find the behind the dog podcast on anywhere that you partake of podcasts so like spotify itunes soundcloud deezer google play stitcher anywhere that you partake of podcast i promise behind the dog is there you can listen to it there so Don nation i hope you enjoyed this week's episode of in the daw and to wrap it all up i have a huge announcement about our au5 ableton sound design course so let's get into that right now Daw Nation, we are so close to releasing our updated version of the AU5 Ableton Sound Design course. The original course had over five hours of content, but this updated version, it has over 20 hours of content. This course not only teaches you how to do absolutely insane sound design using basic tools, but we are also including all the effects racks, instrument racks, project files, and you also get access to an unbelievable amount of bonus material. In fact, some of the bonus material includes a mini AU5 course where he shows you how he created specific sounds in some of his most famous songs. You also get access to a Max for Live course where I show you some of the craziest sound design Max for Live devices. We also have a third party plugin course where AU5 and I show our favorite third party sound design plugins and how to use them. There is also a Whip Masterclass where AU5 sits down and creates an entire song beginning to end from scratch. And finally, there is an AU5 walkthrough course where he walks through three previously released tracks one unreleased track, one track from his new LP, and two tracks from his newest EP, Energize. The original price of the course before all the updates was $147, but with the combination of all the updates and all the bonus material, the new combined value of this course comes out to be $497. And even though most people listening would pay that if they had the money, the unfortunate fact is that most people don't have that kind of money laying around, which is why we've been playing around with the idea of a subscription model, where instead of paying $497, you can have access to everything for only $47 a month. You can cancel anytime, there's no long-term commitments so that you can keep the course as long as you need, but when you're done, you're done. That's it. So Don Nation, again, at this point, we are just playing around with the idea of the subscription model. But if you are interested, please let us know down in the comments, wherever you are. So Don Nation, keep your eyes peeled for the update of the AU5 Ableton Sound Design course. But until then, we'll see you next week for our next episode.